Well, good morning, one and all AP World students. We're going to talk about tech in the 20th century. And of course, think Fiveable, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, check out our YouTube channel. We're here for you. Um, that's what we do. So today we're going to talk about, we're going to quick go over what it means to contextualize and use outside evidence. We'll talk about economic and military technologies. We'll do a little bit of practice. And we'll talk a little bit about some agricultural technology. And then we'll practice a little bit more. So it'll be a sweet uh, little stream. We'll get some practice. We'll talk about some technologies. And then we'll go ahead and, and move on. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw it up in chat. Let me know if you need me to drill down or clear up something. Uh, that is always appreciated. You can always feel free to ask me anything. That's what we're here for. So don't be afraid. Ask away. All right. I have a question for you, though. I want to show you this map right here. Does anybody know what this map is on the left side of the screen? Does anyone know what this map is? You can read the title, but does anybody know uh, what this map is? The ARPANET. Does anyone know what the ARPANET is? I don't, I wouldn't expect, but I'm just curious if there are any like tech historians in the audience who might know what the ARPANET was. One of the original internets. Yeah, so ARPANET stood for Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. And it was a military project in the 1960s and then into the 1980s and 90s. But essentially, it was this radical idea of, hey, what if we, uh, what if we, took computers and we link them together. Like what if we did the same thing we do with telephones and we do them with computers, right? And we will connect these computers. And you're right that the ARPANET will eventually become the internet. Although it's not that ARPANET evolves into the internet, it's that ARPANET creates protocols and codes that will later then be used on the internet. ARPANET was actually discontinued in 1990, but it's protocols where what will become standard on the internet. It's coding, it's language. And the reason I love to talk about the ARPANET is because one of the first four computers that were hooked up to the ARPANET was at the research lab at my own alma mater at UC Santa Barbara. So I always like talking about that because they make it a, a point of pride if you were to go to UC Santa Barbara in California. Um, they like to talk about how you know UCSB was one of the first computers on the internet along with UCLA, Stanford, and just because they didn't want to make it an entirely California thing, they included the University of Utah in uh, Salt Lake City. So, uh, internet prototype in what way? So it's not, so ARPANET is, was, did not continue into the internet. ARPANET was discontinued, but the, the functions and the codes and the way ARPANET was used, the protocols, the typing, uh, all the technical side of things would be carried on into the internet if that answers your question, Tanya. But this is then my question for you guys. Keeping that in mind, is the internet a 20th century technology? Can we call the internet a 20th century technology? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Is the internet as we know it today a 20th century technology? Got some yeses, got some yeses. Oh, I gotta know. Not as we know it today. Some more yeses. I think this is an interesting question. There's not a, not a real solid answer. Oh, how are we doing there, Ashman? See some familiar names in the chat. It's always nice to see familiar faces. But this is what periodization means. It's just a side note in periodization, right? What qualifies as something, right? If we take the ARPANET as the beginning of the internet, then yeah, we would call the internet a 20th century technology, but, right, it was a 20th century idea that was developed in the 21st century, right? So it was the 20th century, I think Sanjeev put it really nicely, right? It's a 20th century idea that's later developed in the 20th century or 21st century, right? And so when we're talking about technologies, right? Sometimes we're just talking about ideas or large, big developments that take a lot of time to 
to come to fruition or to come to their final conclusions, right? I mean, the, most Americans didn't even have access to the internet until I think it was 2004, something along those lines. Most libraries didn't have computers until 1998, I want to say, sometime in the late 90s. My, my own library got computers in like 1995. So really on the tail end of the 20th century. So when we talk about technology in the 20th century, it's always important to think about how much of these might be continuations of things that started way earlier. And that's a way that you can incorporate things outside of a time period that are still relevant to the time period at hand. So if you have a prompt, it's talking about the 1700s, but it's a continuation of something from the 1400s, you can bring in that thing from the 1400s to help strengthen your argument. That's just what I want to say going forward. That's going to be a bit of a theme going forward. Okay, let's quick run over context before we dive into actual technology. Let's talk really quick about context. So on the right here, I have taken the College Board description for context in a DBQ. And I've bolded some of the more important parts. And notice how, about midway down the description, talks about before, during, or continuing after the time frame in question. So context can go, context that is your you're setting the stage for your essay. It can go after your time frame. So our DBQs will be sometime before between 1200 and 1900. It could go longer than that, right? And context hasn't changed this year with our mini DBQ. It still sets the stage for history. It still sets the stage for your essay. It demonstrates to the reader your understanding of history. A lot of students ask, where do you put context? Do you put it at the beginning or do you put it at the end? So they would know the answer to that question. Where do you put it? Where does one drop context? Hmm. A lot of beginnings. And I would argue that the beginning is the best place to put it. This is how I have my students write, is to just kind of put it at the beginning. But Sanjit is correct. Technically, you can put it anywhere. Technically, you can put it anywhere, at the beginning or the end. Again, I, I usually I stress it's, very, it's much better to put it at the beginning. That way it's easier to, to see it. But you can put it at the end. You can totally, you could, you could place it at the end if you needed to. As long as you still set the stage and describe broader historical events, developments, or processes. Right? And so when we're talking about broader historical events, developments, or processes, we need to think thematically, right? We're thinking thematically. What do I mean by think thematically? Well, there's six themes. It's very likely that this year the DBQ will talk about a theme, right? It will discuss a broad topic or a theme. And so a good way to think about your context is to think about the theme. So what's the theme of this particular stream? The theme of this particular stream is technology. And if your prompt happens to talk about technology, a good way to write your context would be to think about technology, right? And you can apply that theme, such as technology, to the broader historical events, developments, and processes that occur before, during, or continue after, right? But the key thing to remember is you always need to connect it, right? Your context does not have to be the, the context does not have to be the same thing that you're going to write about in your essay, but it needs to be connected to it. If your essay asks about state building, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to spend your entire context talking about technology. If you're, if the DBQ asks about trade or culture, then you probably don't want to spend your context talking about political developments. You could talk about political developments, but you would need to make sure they're connected, right? Keep it connected. So that's context. Are there any questions about context? I've linked um, in the resources for this stream, I've linked the slides to another stream that we did back in November 
uh, that, that goes much deeper into context and how to approach context. So you can check that out if you have more questions. Um, this is just kind of a broad overview of context. What could some context be for a topic from 1200 to 1450? That's a good question, right? Because ideally, or at least in theory, a lot of classes didn't cover before 1200. I mean, maybe your teacher did, hopefully. Um, but what could be context for the topic from 1200 to 1450? Um, you could discuss uh, developments during that time period that influenced whatever it is that your DBQ is about. So I would encourage you, this is a great question by thinking thematically, right? If your DBQ is about trade, 1200 to 1450, which it could be, because that's a big, uh, that's a big thing in 1200-1450 is trade. You could talk about political developments that made trade easier or encouraged trade, or you could talk about technological developments that made trade easier, right? That happened at the same time, provided that you don't bring them into your actual essay. Does that answer your question, Sona? That's one particular approach. That's that's one approach. If if your teacher did happen to cover uh, some things before 1200 that are relevant to the topic of the DBQ, then yeah, you could bring that in. Nothing wrong with bringing in evidence from before 1200 if your teacher covered some stuff. Or your textbooks, since most textbooks, most, most students probably don't have new textbooks at this point, you could use info from your textbook that covers old information. So let's really quick take a look at evidence beyond the document. Would something like the bank check be considered a technological innovation? Uh, yeah, Sanjit, I think that could be. Um, that could be that could fall under an economic practice, which is a kind of knowledge which could be you could argue it's a technology. If we were asked to give context on the roles of women in specific countries, how broad should we go? Um, Sarah, do you mean, do you mean, um, could, could you clarify your question a little bit, Sarah, just so I can, I, I think, do you mean like in a particular document or do you mean if your essay had to do with women as a whole? If the prompt as a whole talked about the role of women, how broad should we go? Um, well, again, it's, we're, I think broad is not a bad thing, just in specifically talking about context, right? Um, teacher said, like, when you list countries, the names of countries, do you think that's true? Like, context can be specific. Like, there's nothing wrong with saying, uh, if your essay is about trade, for example, and you want to talk about banknotes, you can say, um, Banknotes developed in the Song Dynasty also contributed to the rise of trade. Like, you can, you can be specific. Just keep in mind that anything put in context that's then scored for the point of context can't be used again for anything else. So it's the double dipping rule, and I've, I've provided a nice illustration, right? You can't use something twice. So if you're going to talk about, for example, banknotes in the Song Dynasty, um, that would be good context for trade, but then you just can't have that again to count as evidence either beyond the document or if this was a regular LEQ, just as evidence. So I hope that clarifies things. Um, Sarah, back to your thing. Um, broad is not a bad thing. If you're discussing the roles of women, you could be fairly broad in your context um, and then sort of you know, narrow it down to your specific region in the thesis itself. Uh, like I said, check out those other slides. They, they talk about how to approach and structure context statements. Um, so this year, when we talk about evidence beyond the documents, and this is kind of what we're going to focus on today, um, there has been a change. Normally, in, in regular years, you would require one piece of evidence from outside the documents. But this year, they're asking for two, and you get one point per piece of evidence. So going for two, even if you miss one for some reason, or they don't give you the point for one, you could still get one point. So they've expanded the opportunities for this. And a lot of people get tripped up by evidence beyond the documents. I'm looking at the poll. A lot of people feel sort of uncomfortable about it. But evidence beyond the document is, is really actually pretty straightforward. It's just think of it like a piece of evidence from an SAQ or an LEQ. What would you do with that, right? You would 
connect it back to your argument, just like a regular piece of evidence. The only difference is it can't be something that is explicitly stated in the documents, right? So if it, but there's, this is, this, this again sounds a little tricky. It's actually pretty straightforward. So here's some examples of how to think about this, right? A person that is connected to the documents but not mentioned, right? So if you had a document about the, uh, if you had a document about, let's say, the voyages of exploration, but they don't ever say Christopher Columbus, then mentioning Christopher Columbus is evidence beyond the documents because that document doesn't talk about Christopher Columbus. Juliana says, the so what part. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So the so what part. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, that's the thing to always remember. Outside evidence can't just be a phrase. It couldn't just be like, oh, by the way, yeah, Christopher Columbus too. Right. You'd have to say something along the you know, Christopher Columbus and the the as an example of uh, age of exploration uh, seafarers kind of thing. So a person connected to but not mentioned, a place that is connected to but not mentioned, or since we're talking about technology, that is connected to but not mentioned in the documents. And again, since we're thinking broadly and thematically here, we can talk about things that are similar in other places. If we're talking about, say, shipping or sailing technology, and they talk about, say, caravels. You have a, say you have a picture of a caravel. That's your document, right? There are several other ship types that are mentioned in the course description, such as the Flucht and the Karak, that you could also mention. And those would be evidence beyond the documents because they're not explicitly mentioned in the documents. Now, of course, again, you need to make sure they're explicitly part of your argument. But the idea is that you can bring it in. So this really actually is not so tricky. Just be sure to remember that if you use it in contextualization, you can't use it again, or at least you couldn't use it for evidence beyond the documents. Are there any questions about that? Thank you so much for everyone who's asked questions so far. Okay. Let's go ahead and now that we've had a little review, let's talk about some technologies. Let's talk technology. So the first thing we're going to talk about is some shipping technology, aka things that have changed the way shipping is done uh, around the world. Let's look a little bit at naval shipping technology. So I have these two pictures here, and I'd like you to look at these two photos. Um, one is, they're, they're both of the same place. One is the port city of Hamburg in Germany in 1900. And then the other one is the port city of Hamburg in Germany in 2000. So 100 years apart. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a look at these and tell me what it is that you notice is both similar but also different about these two pictures. And you can just go ahead and throw that in chat. We'll look at these for a minute. Yeah, that 2000 pick definitely looks like a drone. Like, pro probably was shot with a drone. There aren't any people in that 2000 picture. It was a lot higher off the ground, that's true. Much more colorful, yeah. A lot more supplies in 2000s. Big ships, cargo boxes. Yeah. Very colorful, right? Modern looking ships, Tanya, yeah. Abigail points out there's a lot more stuff. Actual stuff. Okay. The water is calmer. Yeah, it could have been a nicer day. Um, I have another set of photos I'd like you to look at. Same idea, uh, 1900 versus 2000, except now it's in China. This is, this is Shanghai in China. Same idea. What do we see? It's similar. What do we see? It's uh, different. Looks a little more urban. Yeah. Although that could also be, that could be the water, but that also could be just the lens of the camera. It, everything kind of looks a little more yellow in this photo. It's possible it's just the lens of the camera. The boats aren't using sails in the 2000 picture. That's true. Yeah. 
right? Whereas here we can see a, an outrigger boat with a with a lug sail on the left side of the bottom. It's a lug sail. It's a term that comes up in Unit One, but those sails were still being used even in 1900. Yeah, these are and there are fewer buildings in uh, the 2000 photo. It's a little bit further away from the city. You can see it kind of in the distance. Yeah, modern infrastructure and those uh, those crates. So there's a lot of differences, right? Potentially fewer people actually working on ships. People have noticed, right? Those the the infrastructure seems more standardized, right? Um, but a couple of people pointed out about those those boxes, right? The shipping boxes. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about, right? Those boxes those shipping boxes. I'm sure you guys have seen them, right? Those big square containers. They even make houses out of them now. Like those big square containers. You see them at ports and yeah, there's actually I saw one myself in uh, in Canada. They've got this community in Montreal that uh is just made entirely out of those shipping crates. It's actually a really popular thing. And in uh in Oakland, California, I spent some time at a workspace that's made up entirely of those shipping crates. They just bring them in, they run some cables into them, and put up a, a modem, and you've got a workspace. So they are a fascinating creation. Um, officially, they are called the Intermodule Shipping Container, or the ISC, the Intermodule Shipping Container. And their proliferation and popularization is referred to as containerization. Right, containerization of international shipping, right? And uh, we actually have a guy named Malcolm McLean to thank for that. He's the one who kind of popularized this form of shipping in the 1950s, right? AKA the shipping crate. So if you wanna know uh, who's responsible for it, you have Malcolm McLean to thank for that. So as you probably can see from this lovely picture, each container can be loaded and easily stacked on top of one another. They can be locked into place, right? And this is a standardization, right? Notice that almost all of the crates, even if they're different colors, are almost all the same size, right? They're all flat, square, have roughly similar dimensions. We would call this standardization. We would call this standardization. And my question for you is, have we seen trends towards standardization in the in history before 1900? So in the time period at which your, your exam might be, have we seen standardization at play? Have we seen times in history where things became more uniform and standard? Assembly lines, factory, industrialization, paper money, right? Paper money is a form of standardization. That's true, right? So, I mean, industrialization is the big one everybody's pointing out, like Krishna. But you know, standardization is not just in in terms of economics, right? Paper money is itself a kind of standardization. Yeah, the process of Westernization has gone hand in hand with standardization, right? Actually, that's a really good point, Tanya, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, but the, <laughs> the question of adopting cultural values is sometimes tied up with the ability to get cultural materials. And so I don't want to dive too deep into that, but it's a very good point to make, Tanya, the connection between standardization and westernization around the world. So the standardization, by definition, is making sure that inputs and outputs conform to a set standard. And this increases efficiency, right? A lot of people have pointed out the assembly line and the industrial revolution. You literally couldn't have an assembly line if you didn't have standard parts, right? So you, you, you literally standardization and industrialization go hand in hand. The Ford Motor Company, that's a really good example. The Ford Motor Company. Would the Bronze Age trade work Oh, that's a good question. Um, maybe were there standard weights in measurements during the Bronze Age trade? McDonald's, yeah, standardization, right? It's all the same no matter where you go, right? Or Starbucks. 
Although to be fair, McDonald's is not necessarily. To, this is a this is interesting little fact. Um, McDonald's actually outside of the United States is very different. Um, different countries have different foods. Um, sometimes this is this is actually one of the most interesting facts ever. Um, in India, people who own who who work with the McDonald's Corporation, um, most of them are actually not restaurants. They are ice cream stands. Um, so most McDonald's in India are not actually restaurants. They're ice cream stands. There are, of course, if you go to big cities, you'll find McDonald's restaurants. But most by the sheer number, people who sell McDonald's goods in India are individual people with their individual ice cream carts that are portable. Yeah. So, yeah, you guys are noticing like the proliferation of, of, um, of American fast food. And while it is standard, um, there is also a certain level of non-standard, right? So if we were doing a DBQ about fast food, these kind of things are, would be awesome complexity points, pointing these out. So there are a couple of interesting examples that we could think about standardization, possibly outside of the Industrial Revolution. Think about the scientific revolution and how standardization goes hand in hand with science. Think about that. How might standardization go hand in hand with science? Yeah, the scientific method, standardized maps and cartography, that's a good one. It should be noted, I actually looked this up for this, this particular presentation, the metric system didn't become a thing until um, the, the mid-1800s, so that might be a little too late um, for, to apply. To, um, it's not quite a scientific revolution, but the metric system is a universal way of measuring things. That's a big part of that, right? How about the age of revolution? And this one might be a little tricky, but think a little bit about it, right? The age of revolution. Oh, look, standardized education. Tanya's got it. Yeah. Because think about that, right? If you have just created a nation out of a revolution, right, and you want all of your people to know the history of your new country or build up a sense of nationalism, right, you would want to have a standardized education system. Right? Like a history class, right? That's true. And in fact, we didn't even, here's the funny thing, we did not actually get a public school system in the United States until the 1840s in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. And it, you've, you've probably seen the famous video that compares schools to factories, and there's a lot of truth to that. Um, talked a little bit about the Industrial Revolution already. I'd like to point out another small known but very cool little example of international of standardization is the International Time Zone Agreement. The International Time Zone Agreement. If you've ever wondered who dictated all those time zones, well, actually it was an agreement. Or why some countries are multiple time zones and some countries are just one time zone, even though they should be in two. Um, for example, China is all, all one time zone. Um, that was a choice. Iran is also all one time zone. Um, Nice is correct um, that it was influenced by railway companies. That's true. Uh, it was an international agreement in 1884, and as nations became independent, they all joined it. Uh, the very last country to join the international time zone agreement was Nepal in 1956. Last country to get on board with those time zones. Everybody, and now we have globally, worldwide, uh, we're all ahead. Yeah, sometimes they are, uh, the time zones are broken up into fragments too. So that's, that's some ways you can think about the giant shipping containers of today could be connected as a process of standardization to previous developments, right? Whether that's education in your new nation, scientific discovery, or of course the industrial revolution is the big one. So if you were to use say shipping containers as evidence beyond the documents or context, you would need to connect standardization as a process back to the Industrial Revolution, which was a movement in standardization. Cool. All right, let's talk about military stuff. Are there any questions about shipping before we move on to the military? So a lot of the predictions about tech that we had um, came out of, of some of the big, big weapons, right, that we saw in the 20th century. Nuclear weapons, um, poison gas, um, 
we saw a lot of big weapons, but, and those are good predictions, but let me ask you guys this, and you can feel free to speculate in the chat. What piece of military technology, which was developed in the 20th century, mid 20th century, has intensified more conflict, resulted in more casualties, and is currently in the hands of more fighters than any other piece of similar technology today? Could anybody take a guess or speculate what piece of technology might I be talking about that has single-handedly caused more damage and intensified more conflict in this 100-year period than any other weapon of its type. So I see a lot of people saying guns or machine guns or rifles. We may need to be a little more specific than that. Tanks. It's actually one of the most basic weapons that there is. One of the most simple weapons that there are and i know for a fact that you know what it looks like and i know for a fact that you've seen it either in real life or in a movie it is the most widely used weapon of its type in the world today the most widely used weapon of its type these are all great great educated guesses these are awesome no it's the automata of kuleshnikova 1947 the ak-47 is the most widely used firearm in the world today, right? Does anyone know why, out of curiosity, it is the most widely used firearm in the world today? Distance. Precision. Well, reload speed, damage. It is an assault rifle, which is, you know, a, a, a devastatingly powerful type of gun as we've sadly discovered in the United States through a number of very tragic, tragic incidences. Um, but that's not necessarily why it's the most used because there's lots of different types of assault rifles like the M16, the M4, the AR-15, the, there's just so many different types, right? Why is this one used so much? Uh, some people, some people, uh, Duluth's got it, Night has got it, Krishna's also pointing at some of the things. Um, Part of the reason why its impact is because it is, in fact, very easy to use, right? You don't actually need that much training to know how to use an AK-47, right? A couple of hours and you can get it down. If you need to clean it or repair it, it's actually really easy to take apart. You can do it in about uh, 15 minutes. You can take most of the big pieces apart. So it's very easy to use, easy to repair. And during the Cold War, it's very easy to get your hands on, right? And so you could you could very easily get your hands on a huge number of these AK-47s. You could put them in the hands of peasants, and then with just a little bit of training, you potentially had a fighting force with which you could challenge existing authorities. You want to start an insurrection against the government? All you need are a couple of AKs, right? Of course, not that I'm encouraging anyone to go challenge the government. That would be a very bad idea, but... The point is a widely distributed, easily accessible firearm that deals a lot of damage is a challenge to governments, right? And especially during the Cold War, if you were a friend of the United States, the Soviet Union would just send you crates of these things, right? Just tons of them. All the ammunition you could ever want, spare parts, people to train you how to use them. It's why the AK is the most widely used gun in the world today is in part because of the Cold War and it's ease of use. So a gun or a technology, a military technology that is proliferates and encourages warfare because of its ease of use, its ease of production, and its devastating impact, right? Have we seen that before in human history, right? Where a new military technology perhaps altered the the landscape of of a place the political landscape oh maxim guns and the gatlin guns right and how did those things alter the political landscape conflict exists but maybe not to this extent right that's what, so tiny as we call intensification right intensification of conflict where it becomes more intense. Rebellions? Yeah. Imperial, like when we think about those machine guns, we think about imperialism, right? 
alters the balance of power between Europe, Europeans and Africans, right? Standard infantry rifles, but I think Duluth points out rebellions, right? It's also really easy to rebel if you have a firearm that can do the same amount of damage as the firearm that you're, the state you're rebelling against would be doing. Thank you, Tanya, for, for taking that. What about artillery, even though it was made before the 1900s, rocket launchers? Those would both be excellent examples of trends that continued into the 20th century. Of course, artillery, um, that has its roots way back during the Song Dynasty in the 1200s. So a couple of you guys put your hands on, put your kind of put your finger on the point. Um, imperialism, we often think about those guns, right? Whether it's guns, germs, and steel in the Americas, or it's the Gatlin gun in Africa, right? We tend to think about the the rapid fire power that these weapons could give their their users, right? And we think about the gunpowder empires, the Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughals. Um, and you might even think about the Thirty Years' War in Europe, right? Yeah, you could bring it all the way back to the gunpowder empires. So let's say you get a DBQ that asks about political rise of these gunpowder empires, right? And you want to talk about how guns made a big difference. You could potentially contextualize that by pointing out that even in the modern era, in the 20th century, guns destabilized and challenged existing authorities via their wide distribution and easy use. And of course, the age of revolution. Actually, that might have been better for the age of revolutions, right? In the American Revolution, nobody had to be an expert soldier to fight the British. All you needed was a musket, right? Whereas back in, say, the 1200s, if you wanted to rebel against your lord, you'd need to be a trained soldier to do that. So. I believe Fiveable already has a stream on gunpowder technology. I'll see if I can link that in the resources. So let's do a little practice really quick. So what I have here is a pretend prompt for a pretend DBQ about state building, right? And I have a, a list of pretend documents, right? Hypothetical documents that go into this, into this hypothetical DBQ, right? Thinking about what we've seen, just talking about like shipping and talking about weapons, um, what could you potentially bring to this document? What what could you hypothetically bring? Oh, that's right, my little my little face is covering the the thing. I forgot about that. Um, let me see if I can unfocus the screen, and maybe I can. There we go. Um, can you see it now? Not quite as big, but okay. So let's, taking a look at this, let's see what we could bring any of the technologies we've talked about, or if you have another one that you can think of that's outside of the time period 1450 to 1750, right? What technology outside of that time period could you bring in as, say, outside evidence that's not listed on this little list of hypothetical documents? So take a second, no worries, take, take a minute. So Yuliana, you're talking about trade. Is there a particular technology you could bring, uh, you could bring to the trade table? Sana says the Pax Mongolica as a political development, uh, bringing the gunpowder trade to Europe, that's definitely true. The gunpowder trade was brought to Europe via the Pax Mongolico. So you could talk about gunpowder technology, perhaps. So Sarah points out that you could, we're talking about state building, right? But you could also expand state building to include imperialism, right? And you could bring in firearms technology there. Krishna's talking about the Islamic empires. Since this is a very broad prompt, and it doesn't specify one area, right? And since none of these hypothetical documents talk about any of the specific Islamic empires, you could bring in the technologies that they used, right? You could talk about the cannons that knocked down the walls of Constantinople, or didn't knock down the walls of Constantinople, the cannons that battered Constantinople, right? Ooh, the trade network. 
the roads in the Americas, right? The Inca roads. The roads are a good technology. That's a good one. That's awesome. Um, Sanjit's talking about absolute versus parliamentary. Maybe. Is there a technological aspect there, perhaps? That road one, though, that's a good one, Sarah. Road networks. The Inca roads. That's a technology. It's it's tough to build roads up and down a mountain. That's a tough one. Firearms, gunpowder technology, right? Roads. I think another good one might be, if we're talking about technologies that help build a state. Maritime trade, right? Taxing and using maritime trade. Ah, the galleons, right? The Spanish galleons. That's a good one too, right? That silver was key to, to creating and then later destroying the Spanish empire through inflation. So that's a good one. Uh, the Latin sale, kind of connecting with that trade as profit as state. Uh, the Trans-Saharan network. Um, I would say, Juliana, that, that kind of continues, right, in both of those eras. Difficulties and interests affected what part of the state developed more than others. Yeah, so like how much does a ruler spend on their army versus how much does a ruler spend on like building a road or building a a a, a caravanserai or something like that? That's a really good that's that's complexity right there, right? That probably most famously applies to the Soviet Union, like the question of did you you know, you built, spent all this money building your weapons while your people were kind of hungry. Guns versus butter is the, the trade-off, they call it. Junks and Dows, that's a good one. Silver, maybe the mining technology for silver, the Potosi mines or the Mito labor system. Uh, the astrolabe and the compass, yeah, those are good navigational technologies that would have encouraged trade and therefore would have made an empire rich. The Trans-Siberian Railroad, that is a good one, allowing the Russian Empire to control Siberia. That's a good one. Cool, well, these are all great. It's good to think broadly, right? So the theme is state building, right? But we wanna think broadly about technologies that might connect to that theme of state building. So when we think about outside evidence, we definitely wanna think broadly, thinking thematically, right? I don't know if any of your teachers have you do those charts, the spice tea charts, or they have you do the themes and come up with examples by theme. Sometimes you do it by like a state or an empire. Those are good for thinking broadly. And so if you have some of those, it might be a good idea to review them kind of coming up. The Central Bank of England, yeah, that could be. A little uh, uh, control the monetary supply, could be, yeah. Let's talk about agriculture, right? Now agriculture, of course, back when this class used to be 8,000 to 2,000, um, used to be a big part of unit one. But we've seen some big developments in agriculture throughout this course, even though it's now only 1,200 to, to, to 1,900. We've, we have seen some big changes in agriculture, and you can probably think about some of those, like there was the agricultural revolution, quote unquote, that happened right before the industrial revolution in England, the land enclosure movement and new technologies. Yeah, GMOs, what an interesting point to make. So GMOs are part of it, um, that would be called the Green Revolution, yeah, which occurred kind of between the 40s and the 80s. This is a good example of not just a particular technology, but a broad development that happened over a long period of time. Um, but essentially, it's the development and then use around the world of what we call industrial agricultural technology. What do we mean by industrial? Well, we mean fertilizer that's not just made out of animal manure, but is actually made out of chemicals, right? We refer to industrially produced farm tools like tractors or airplanes that can drop pesticides. And irrigation, like this gigantic irrigation machine you can see at the top here, right? The, the development of all of these, yeah, uh, let me just get that back over. The development of all these, oops, go, there we go. So the development of all of these, um, is what we call the Green Revolution. Yes, it does. Um, and so these technologies were developed and then they were later kind of spread out and they've, they've had a big impact in a lot of parts of the world. 
um, most notably India, Mexico, Brazil, and some parts of Africa. And this is not like, you know, this is, this is an intensely debated thing. Like what have been the long-term implications of using all this chemical of fertilizer, pesticides, and then as Nisa would later point out, the GMOs, right? Genetically modified uh, crops, which is also a big part of this, was kind of the diffusion of standardized crops around the world. Um, so there is a lot of debate around this. In fact, I think it was in 2013 or it was 2012. This, the Green Revolution was the DBQ uh, for that year. It was all about like weighing the consequences of the, DB, of the, the Green Revolution. So you can actually find that if you Google AP World Green Revolution DBQ, you can find out a lot about it. Um, Fritz Halber's process for making manure, ammonia, yeah. And then take, in, take that, put it on an industrial scale. Um, and so the Green Revolution is a, is a historical process that while it, it occurred in the 20th century, right, it does reflect earlier developments in agriculture, right? Because every time we've tweaked agriculture, what tends to happen? We tend to get more food, which means we tend to get more people, or farmers tend to get a little bit better off, right? So thinking about the Green Revolution, what could you connect it to, right? What themes are at play when we talk about the Green Revolution, and what things in history that we've previously seen could be connected to the Green Revolution, if we had to make a connection or a comparison? Well, it's definitely connected to the Industrial Revolution, that's true, because you don't have industrial fertilizer without industry. Champa rice in China, right, the diffusion of a single crop having a really big impact. Yeah, one of the big parts of the, the Green Revolution was the diffusion of certain strains of wheat and rice to many parts of the world that made them easier to grow. That's a big part of it. Yeah, so champa rice would be an excellent. If you were talking about production, the increase in production in the 1400s to the 1700s, right, you could potentially talk about the Green Revolution as context. Right, Doluth points out a lot of cultural exchange and trade. Ooh, the Colombian Exchange. Leon, you want to tell us a little bit more about the Colombian Exchange? I think you're on to something there. Crop rotation in Europe, yeah. That would be an example of increasing agricultural yields, right? And then all kind of the, the population growth that goes along with that can be linked to the Green Revolution, which has largely been credited with having populations rise so much in places like India and Mexico. Um, global free markets. Yeah, that's part of it. That's definitely part of it. Uh, the ability to trade this technology around and kind of spread this technology and, and sell it to these other nations. Uh, soils didn't lose nutrients as fast with crop rotation. Yeah. And some crops even replenish the soil. That's true. Brought about new assimilations of goods in different cultures. Yeah. Some of those goods included crops. So the climate exchange did include cultures. We talk about like syncretism, like voodoo and, and the, our version of Guadalupe Hidalgo in Mexico. Um, but it also brought a lot of crops, right? And if you've ever seen that map of the Columbian Exchange, the one that's got the arrows pointing in like both directions, like to the Americas and back to Europe, um, you could see the little, the crops that go one way and then the, the animals that go the other way. So, and I think even one of the, the, the course description includes uh, um, okra and manok, which are, are sorry, not okra, or sorry, not manok, uh, okra and rice, which were brought over to the Americas from Africa by enslaved people. Cool. So we'll wrap it up with this little practice. Let me unfocus the camera so you can see. Uh, let me unfocus the screen so you can see. Yeah, the transatlantic trade was one of those, yeah. So here's another potential prompt, right? Except this time it's asking about the Colombian exchange and the impact of social and economic conditions. So from within this time period, 1450 to 1750, what things that are not listed in this hypothetical document description could you use, technologically speaking, that are not listed in this hypothetical document description? Ooh, you're talking about the Bantu migrations and the arrival of the banana, right? That's a good one. That would be a nice, 
that'd be a nice connection right there. The Bantu migrations and helping diffuse bananas to Southern Africa. Oh, the banana did actually come with the Malay people in Madagascar, but you're right, the Bantus helped move the, the banana a little bit further south. Uh, you can talk about the, the labor systems. It's true. Yeah, you can talk about the age of exploration, right? You could just go ahead and contextualize the whole thing, right? You could talk about all of that, all the sailing technology that makes the Columbian Exchange possible. You could talk about the monsoon winds in the Indian Ocean as another example of understanding uh, climate. You talk about the economic system set up in the Americas, right? Since it doesn't seem to imply, um, it doesn't talk about specifically, well, it does talk about slave plantations, but if you want to talk about the other ones, like in Karina, Sarah said the Hacienda system, right? <clears throat> you talk about the Mita system or the Encomienda system. Yeah, you could potentially also talk about the gender imbalance in parts of Africa that resulted from the slave trade. That's true. Uh, Nice also said the increased reliance on potatoes in Ireland. That's that is also a good one, right? The kind of the shift of potatoes and potato growing knowledge to Ireland and then later the rest of Europe, right? Which made Europe largely dependent on potatoes, right? We think about the stereotype of certain like Eastern Europeans as like potato farmers, right? But potatoes are not indigenous to Eastern Europe. Tanya's thinking broadly and she's thinking about migration. Well, yeah, there was migration, right? The climate exchange included movements of peoples and an increase in trade goods being considered luxuries. Yeah, Sla um, sugar, tobacco, um, cotton, things that were necessary for a lot of really pretty things. Impact of disease on the population. Yeah, that definitely has social implications. Yeah, the British and their textile trade in India. That's a big one. That's a good one. That would kind of be outside of the Columbian Exchange, but that could possibly be a contextualizing point. Yeah. For this hypothetical prompt, would it be a good idea to compare and contrast the essay between two hemispheres? You could, yeah. So that's the thing about this kind of prompt. It sets itself up nicely for pretty much whatever you want to do with it. You could compare two hemispheres. You could do a change in continuity over time or you could potentially do a causation, right? The causes and the consequences of the Columbian Exchange, right? They would want you to probably focus more on the consequences, but you could do either way. I'd say if you wanna talk about technology of the Columbian Exchange, probably the big ones would be the sailing technology. Um, it would also be the weaponry that helped the Europeans conquer the Americas, as well as the diffusion of crops and the knowledge to grow them. But the places set up in Africa to hold slaves to be considered technology, the, those locations like Gori Island, um, maybe. The slave trade itself and the impact of maybe weapons on the slave trade, guns on the slave trade. <coughs> Is there an essay responding to this prompt? Um, sorry. <coughs> I don't believe so. I don't actually know if there's been a DBQ about the Columbian Exchange. I just made this up. <clears throat> I think there has been, <coughs> sorry. I think there has been a Columbian Exchange LEQ, but I don't think there's been a Columbian Exchange DBQ. Yeah, tobacco is definitely a cash crop. That's a big one. Cool, Alrighty. So I'm gonna refocus this screen. Well, then we're about out of time, so I want to just leave you with a few things. When thinking about how to use evidence that's maybe outside of your time period or is not uh, explicitly mentioned in a document, right, keep three things in mind. One, keep it broad, right, especially when we're doing context, think broadly, think thematically, right? So if your prompt has to do with state building, think about all the things that go into state building. Right, not just the political stuff, but think about the tech, the economic, the cultural. And if you're going to use evidence outside the documents, don't forget when you have when you use evidence outside the documents, don't forget to make the connection to the argument clear. It's the so what, as Juliana was saying earlier. Right, you want to make sure it's clear what your connection is. Right, 
And of course, avoid double dipping. Not, not cool with French fries, not cool on your DBQ. Um, but yeah, that's what I've got for you today. Thanks so much for joining. Lovely, awesome, lively chat. Really appreciated having you. I'll stick around for like a minute. If I think I answered the questions. There was one question about the Song Dynasty. And yeah, Sarah got that one. Thanks so much for that, Sarah. But yep, thanks all of you. And hopefully, um, yeah, I'll see you in the near future.